Amen. First Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to jump right in. But in all sincerity, everybody that's a first time visitor, we thank God for you. Whether you're watching online or in the building, we just thank God for you. I told my mother, I think I've officially entered into semi-senior citizen role. Because I put on a jacket with some, you know, not dress shoes. I put on a suit with and they're not dress shit. I'm, I'm just, my, my, my back hurt. And I ain't still none of y'all. My back is hurting today. Amen. Stacy Adams just didn't agree with me today. It just didn't. Amen. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> but I praise God for my wife in her absence. Can we give God a praise for her? Today is her birthday. Amen. Amen. My sweet thing. I wish y'all would have been with us in St. Paul the other night. That fella put down, talking about his wife, and she put down, talking about him. The preacher, Pastor Worley, boy, he laid all, he laid it out. Boy, I, I'm going to go back and watch it so I can try to cop it out. When I'm going to go back. He laid it out. Boy, I, I often see preachers get up there, and they lay that whole thing out. It's, it's good. It's good. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you have your Bibles or your electronic devices, open up. And if you don't have it, if you do what the scriptures say and look up, look to the hills, it'll be right here on the screen. Your help just came. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse number 12. I'm reading from New King James Version. Listen, I, I'm not going to hate on you. If you want to stand for the word, you can. If that's your normal custom, uh, here we, we don't require that you stand. But either way, you need to stand on the word, whatever you do. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 20. It says, now, if Christ preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching, watch this, is empty. And your faith is empty also. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. And if in fact the dead do not rise, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. Somebody say futile. We're going to explain that in a minute. You are still in your sin. Then also those of you who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Hallelujah. Praise God for the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Tonight. I want to talk about a real simple subject. I want to talk about the importance of his rising. The importance of his rising. Hallelujah. I got a witness. Thank you. Every now and then, life will bring an issue to y'all. It'll bring an issue to us that demands you to make a decision. Life has a way of putting you in the context where a line in the sand has been drawn. You've got to choose between two mutually exclusive events. Every now and then you'll find yourself with the decision where there's no gray area. There's no middle ground. There's no both and. And it's, it's either and or it's or. And you've got to choose where you stand. An example where the line in the sand was drawn, mama, in the civil rights movement, when one side there stood nonviolent practices and principles of Brother Martin Luther King Jr. On the other side stood by any means necessary with Brother Malcolm. Even today in the world we live, the political landscape, it requires that we make some decisions. Where do you stand on abortions? Where do you stand on the Religious uh, Freedom Restoration Act? Where do you stand on gun reform? Where do you stand on the stand your ground laws? There are decisions that need to be made, but Sister Penny, it's not always that deep. You know, some of our decisions, they're athletic, Brother Al. In the, in the 80s, it was either magic or it was Larry Bird. Right? 
And even today, the decision got to be made between LeBron, Michael Jordan, or Kobe. Amen. And if you were born when I was born, you know that there were some really difficult decisions we had to make. In our era, it was either Batman or Superman. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, some of y'all know about that. Watch this. Pop Hulk Hogan or Randy Macho Man Savage. Yes, sir. See, I knew I'd get an amen on the front. Mama, I got you. Is it Dallas or Dynasty? Which one was it? Somebody said Dynasty. All right, Sister Monique, Prince or Michael Jackson? It has got to be one of them. It's got to be one of them. Prince. Prince. Uh-huh. I got to stay on this side because they don't know about it. Uh, Mother Thompson, Luther Vandross or Marvin Gaye? Which one was it? She said both. <laughs> Hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm coming, Roger. I'm coming for you right now. It, Biggie or Tupac? I thought you were saying. Wait a minute. Hold on. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. Right, bro, punch out. Boys in the hood or juice? See, see, see? And, and the biggest, watch this, y'all. The, the, the biggest dilemma when we were growing up, watch this, was new edition with Bobby Brown. Or new edition without Bobby Brown. Somebody said, well, see, see, that, that's the biggest, this, that's the biggest one. Amen. And even today, young folk got some diff I'm coming for you. Y'all got some difficult decisions. Drake or Lil Wayne. Okay, 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 okay. Nikki or me. Ni okay, okay. And watch this, that's all y'all get. Because y'all ain't got real music. I couldn't, I, I had four people I could call out. That's it. I, I was trying. To, but, but regardless of our age, at some point in this journey, we got to make a decision of who the mastermind was. Watch this. Between Lucius or Cookie. Somebody, see, 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 see. Go home and, and y'all watch the reruns and y'all we'll come back and talk about it. Amen. But life is filled with difficult decisions that's got to be made. And the one that will define and shape life the most, it ain't your political leanings. It's not your athletic or your artistic preferences. But rather, I would suggest to you on this Saturday night, a week before Easter, that the greatest decision you have to make is where you stand on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Either you reject it or you believe it. Amen. It is that necessity of making a decision about the resurrection of Jesus that causes Paul to put pen to paper and write this letter to the church in Corinth. As background, I want to remind you that the church of Corinth was arguably Paul's most successful ministry work. This city in Corinth, upon hearing the good news of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it begins to grow big time, both in number and spiritually. But for all of its growth, all of its uh, possibility, the church in Corinth, like none other, was deeply disturbed. They had big problems, big problems. And for all of you, amen, you, you'll find that the church in Corinth was divided and it was split on many issues. Does that sound like any churches y'all ever been in? But they were split. Some of it was who, who was their favorite preacher. That was in the Bible. They battled that in Corinth. Some of them liked Paul. Some of them liked Apollos. It's in the Bible. They were split on issues of sexual morality. They had doctrinal debates about the Lord's Supper and the use of appropriate gifts, particularly speaking in tongues. They had problems with that. But the biggest issue, the biggest debate, the biggest divide that causes Paul to write is when he catches wind that the church in Corinth is arguing about the reality of the resurrection of the dead. And you'll find in Corinth that they did not all agree on the resurrection of the dead because many of them were influenced by Grecian philo philosophical thought, particularly that of Plutarch and his philosophy argued that the greatest existence of the eternal soul uh, was when it was liberated by death. 
from the incarnation of the flesh. And so it rejected the, re, uh, the resurrection of the dead under the grounds that resurrection would be reincarnation of the soul in the flesh of the human body. Stay with me. Had to give a little background. And so while Paul gets word that these Christians are being swayed by uh, Plutarchian Christian philosophy, he writes to them to argue about the foolishness of their disbelief. And here's what Paul, in essence, says. I'm going to say it in bun level language. He said, if the dead are not raised, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is still dead, then me and you are in a whole lot of trouble. That's what Paul said. Because the resurrection of Jesus is the most critical thing in the life of a believer. And Paul makes a definitive declaration in verse number 20 when he simply says he says i'm gonna say it bun level style get it straight christ is risen from the dead he said christ is risen from the dead and if there's anything that ought to put some joy in our hearts on tonight and if anything ought to make you clap your hands sometimes and stand up on your feet it, it, it's when you hear the good news that christ is risen from the dead. Now, in, in, in case you haven't found out why you ought to be happy right there, listen to what Paul says. He says the resurrection of Jesus is important, number one, because it proves that your faith is not in vain. Somebody I just say, my faith is not in vain. Not in vain. Hallelujah. Listen to what Paul argues. If you read it, he says, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. That word futile means it's useless. Your faith is useless. That if Christ is still dead, your faith in God is nothing more than just wishful thinking. Nothing more than uh, imagined realities. That if Christ is still dead, there is no substance to your faith. And I don't know how that make y'all feel. But Sister Q, that scares me a little bit. Because there have been some moments in my life when faith was all I had to hold my life together. Can I get a witness in this place? I need to preach to somebody on your row that knows that when the odds are against you and when the prognosis don't look good and, and you don't have anybody else that you can call on, you reach a point in life where the only thing that keeps you sane and in your right mind the only thing that makes you wake up in the morning and the only things that sometimes keep you from putting a gun to your head is that you got some faith that God is still able to make a way out of no way. Can I just pause real quick and ask, is there anybody in this place that's ever been in a place where faith was all you had? Faith that God would hear your prayer. Faith that God would make a way. I'm talking about some showing up faith. I'm scanning the room. I want to see what I'm working with tonight. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. And, and, and if Christ is dead, your faith has no power. Hallelujah. So the argument of Paul is that the resurrection of Jesus gives your faith some legs to stand on. The resurrection of Jesus put some substance behind your belief. The resurrection of Jesus gives evidence to why you believe what you believe. Hallelujah. Because whenever you remember that Christ has been raised from the dead, it ought to trigger three words in your mind. Write them down, post them on Facebook, do what you want, make it your next tattoo if you want to, if that's your thing. Three words you need to remember from the resurrection of Jesus. It's real simple. Y'all ready? God is able. Y'all always look for something deep. God is able. Maybe I need to say it to, to God is able. No matter what you face, God is able. No matter how dark the night, God is able. No, no matter how long it's been, God is able. No matter how bad you feel right now, God is. No matter who says you couldn't do it, God 
I wish I had some folk in this house who knew that you knew that you knew that God is able. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. And I know he's able because I was hurting so bad in my back earlier today. I don't feel no pain right now. God is able. Hallelujah. And I know I took ibuprofen and Tylenol, but I, I, I think it was God. If it ain't, just take me to the hospital when I leave. Old folks can't say hospital, hospital. Hallelujah. That, that, that my faith is not in vain. That if God could, could raise Jesus from the dead, y'all, surely he's able to work stuff out for me for my good. Surely he's able to, to, to go exceedingly and abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think. Surely God is able. I told you I'm trying to be cute in front of this Sade. Y'all pray for me. Hallelujah. Paul says his rising is important because it proves that your faith is not in vain. But secondly, I'm going to move. It proves that your fears are not valid. Your fears are not valid. Watch this because Christ has risen and, and I graduated from the most prestigious institution in North Carolina, possibly in America. I graduated from Phelps State University. So go Bronco, you got the colors on too, bro. But so I'm going to say something that's not grammatically correct, but it's good gospel. Okay? It's theologically sound because Christ, because Christ has risen, you ain't got nothing to be afraid of. That's bad English, but it's a good gospel. Because he lives, but, 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 but because he lives, because he lives, there's nothing that ought to scare us. We need to hear that tonight. Bro, Puncho, I'm so tired of running into so-called saints that ain't got no back in their backbone, that don't know how to stand flat-footed, self-proclaiming Christians, ain't got enough faith in God to know that everything is going to be all right. How can you serve a risen Christ and still be a punk? I'm sorry, I shot it and, 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 not, and be weakened. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bro said you're going to get me out of the service. Amen. But how can you serve a risen Christ and be a spiritual punk? Amen. How can you serve a risen Christ and still be scared of what your neighbor's going to think about you? I ain't done none of mine. They don't pay not one bill across the field where we at. Ain't studying them. Not nay one of them. But how can you serve a risen Christ and always walk around scared? Hallelujah. Here's what Paul argues in case y'all ain't got it yet. He says the reason we don't have to be scared, the reason we don't have to be afraid, is because the rising. The resurrection of Christ, it proves, watch this, it proves that death has been defeated. And Paul goes on to argue in this chapter, and Christ in his rising, in his resurrection, has put all enemies under his feet. Hallelujah. Which means, hallelujah, that Christ has dominion over death. And that our God is neither stopped and he's not slowed by the presence of death. So in other words, whenever we see death, don't ever make the mistake of, of thinking that death means that God is no longer in control. Don't think that death means that the hands of God have been tied. Don't think that death means that God is not still on the throne because our God works through on the other side of death. Watch this. So, 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 so it's, it's as hard as it is for us to imagine this, trying to find some good in it, because I'm still praying, trying to find it. Those children that got killed earlier this week, God is working behind, some kind of way, God is working behind the scenes. 
if it does nothing but, but bring folk to church to pray and seek him. Tell somebody God is working. When, when, when we see hundreds die due to earthquakes, God works through that kind of stuff. When, when you got to bury your mama or your daddy, God can work through that stuff. When, when we've seen young and innocent lives gunned down in the streets by cops, God's working through that some kind of way. Because our God is not hindered by death. Now, now, I, I, I know some of y'all. I just know you. You're saying, Pastor, if death is defeated, then why we still got to deal with it? Heard you. I mean, if Jesus was resurrected from the dead and death is under his feet, why do we have to deal with death? Why is death a constant reality in our lives? So to help you understand why death didn't go away, I got to take you back about 50 years. Stay with me. I need to take you back to the year of 1974. I ain't going to ask y'all to raise your hand about how many were alive. Don't even worry about it. But we're going back to 1974. The date is May 20th. And that night, Pop, was arguably the greatest sporting event in the 20th century. Some of y'all trying to figure out what it was. It was the boxing heavyweight title between George Foreman and Muhammad Ali. Y'all stay with me for a minute. Some of y'all recall that the fight didn't take place in Las Vegas like most big fights do. The fight went, it didn't happen in Bun Level. We had some big fights in Bun Level too, but they won't hear it either. <laughs> the fight went down in Kansasha Zaire. And Sister uh, McDougal, it was labeled the Rumble. It, see, oh, senior citizen right here on the front. See, you know it. In the jungle. The Rumble in the jungle. And it was hyped up because in 1967, Ali had lost the belt because he refused to join the army to go fight in the Vietnam War. And in 1968, to one, George Foreman won the gold medal in the Olympics and went on to take the heavyweight title by beating down Joe Frazier. I'm trying to help y'all. So when you go to the barbershop, you can talk. Here we go. And so when the rumble in the jungle went down, Jonathan Ali was not the favorite to win. Why? Because George Foreman was seven years younger. And for the first time in his career, Ali was fighting a boxer who was bigger and stronger than he was. And the word was, bro, Roger, that if George Foreman can hit Ali, Ali going to fall. And, and so... Sister Monique, Ali, he introduced a fighting technique that had never been seen before. It was called the rope-a-dope. See, all the senior citizens, they moving with me. Y'all remember. It's the rope-a-dope. And the rope-a-dope was simple. Ali would ball himself up and lean against the ropes and just let George Foreman hit him. Just hit him. Hard as he could. Just letting him hit him. And every time Foreman hit him, Ali had a lot of mouth. Ali just looked at him. Is that all you got? That all you got? And Foreman just kept swinging. Just bam, 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 bam. Swinging and swinging. And about the eighth round, Foreman, yeah, he was tired. And right then, Ali seized the moment. And he knocked him down four times in the same round. And the referee called the fight. It was a TKO. And Ali won the battle. It was one of the greatest fights in the history of boxing. But the strange thing is, sweetie, there was never a rematch. Foreman and Ali, they never fought again. Now, Foreman kept fighting, but he never got a rematch with Ali. It's one of the few times, fellas, in boxing history that a champ has been beaten and didn't get a rematch. And when Ali was interviewed and asked why he didn't give Foreman a rematch, I told you he had a lot of mouth. He said in good old Ali fashion, I beat him so bad the first time, ain't no to fight him again. Y'all missed it. When the former champ got beat real bad, the new champ said, because I beat him so bad, I never have to fight him again. Come here for a minute. Let's go to Calvary. And let me show you death, which at the time was the heavyweight champion of the world. But he lost to Jesus on a hill far, far away. 
And when Jesus got up out the grave, God declared, he said, I beat death so bad that I never have to fight death again. You ought to just nudge your neighbor and just help me preach and tell them, neighbor, you ain't got to be scared. Because we already have the victory. Because God got up out of that grave. Holly, I'm trying not to go too fast. I'm trying not to go too fast. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I got, I got, I got to leave y'all. I'm going to get on out of here because, amen. I told y'all my back was hurting earlier. I feel good now, so I need to get home. Happy birthday to you. If you ain't happy, it's because you miserable. Happy in my marriage. Hallelujah. Give God a praise my wife. Hallelujah. The birthday girl. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody said, get back to the preacher. Preacher. Okay. Okay. Paul says, watch this. Paul. Paul says it's important because my faith is not in vain. My fears are not valid. And then finally, he says, the reason there is importance in his rising is because my forgiveness is not void. Some of y'all, I could just pass the mic. Y'all can preach that one. My forgiveness is not void. Here's the startling, the shocking, and the disturbing consequence that Paul lays out. He says, if Christ is not risen, we just read it, we are still in our sin. Paul said, if Christ is not risen, our debt has not been paid. If Christ is not risen, our sins still stain our soul. God, if Christ is not risen, then we are not forgiven of our faults and our failures. He said, if Christ is still dead, then he lied. And he died as a common criminal. He died as an imposter who wasn't the Messiah. He died as a liar and a fake. If Christ is still dead, then we are still in our sins. But since Christ lives, all my sin has been washed away. Since Jesus lives, my name has been changed. Since Jesus rose, tell somebody, I am a new creation. Since Jesus lives, my sins have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And I am forgiven. Ain't that good news on tonight? Watch this, watch this, watch this. And I'm, I'm getting ready to go. Some of y'all still don't seem to understand why it's, it's important to, to, to know that Christ has risen. So I'm going to close it like this. I promise you, I'm, I'm finished because now, now my, my back's starting to hurt again. But, but, but here it is. Watch this. I remember having a good friend back in my younger days. And I'm going to keep his name anonymous. I'm going to keep it hidden so my parents don't try to connect the dots and figure out who I'm talking about some 35 years later. Where did I'm going to come up with a crazy name? I'm, I'm going to call him Otis. Okay? His, I'm going to call him Otis. Okay? I ain't got no friend. I got an uncle, but I ain't got no friends named o Otis. So for the sake of the story, his name is Otis. Now, Otis was a great friend. Otis was cool. As a matter of fact, he was one of my best friends. And I'm going to tell y'all why. I was hanging out with Otis and his family one, one day during the summer at his aunt's house. Now, you need to know, bro, Roger, you need to know that she did not have a child-friendly house, okay? I'm going to explain that. She was old school. She had that living room that you couldn't go in with the white carpet and that, that plastic runner. Y'all remember that plastic runner? The white, and, and white furniture with plastic on it. Yeah, yes, I'm okay, okay. She had that living room you couldn't go in. And if you got caught in there, it was a beating waiting to happen. Her house it wasn't child friendly. She had glass statues all over the house. And so there I am, Pop trying to figure out who I'm talking about, at Otis's aunt's house with all of Otis and his cousins. We just over there cutting up, having fun. And, and Jonathan, it was raining outside. And his aunt had left to go to the store. 
So we were playing inside the house. And somebody threw me a ball. And I missed it. I missed it. And I swung my arm back. I was upset. Because I missed it. Cause that, because I missed it, that put me out the game we were playing. And I knocked over, yeah, one of them glass statues. Help me, Holy Ghost. It f Mama trying to figure out, who he's talking about? It fell to the ground, and the statue broke. And everybody got quiet. Because we knew it was about to go down. So, so, Sister Sade. We did what many children think they know how to do. We tried to cover it up. So we swept up the broken glass, but we made the mistake, Naya, of putting the glass in the garbage in the kitchen. I know, we panicked. So his aunt came back from the store. She came in the house and walked right by where the statue used to be. So I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I got my George Jefferson walk. And she ain't say nothing. And we thought we had gotten away with it, Monty. So we, 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 it stopped raining. We get ready to go outside. We all out the door. We running. And all of a sudden, we heard his aunt holler out the famous phrase that lets you know there's a problem. Y'all know what that is? Hey! <laughs> when you hear that in the country, Something is wrong. Hey. All y'all getting here. So, 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 bro, Al, we came in and she looked at us and she said, who broke my statue? Sister Monique, ain't nobody say nothing. Then she said, somebody going to pay for this. Yeah, we sat there quiet. And she said, who broke my statue. Bro, Willie, ain't nobody said nothing. Nothing. So she walked out. She went in her closet. Got a belt. I tried to get on my bike and go home. She said, no, sit down. Somebody going to pay for this. Once again, who broke my statue? Mama, everybody was quiet. Quit trying to figure it out. I see your face. Don't worry about it. It's been 35 years or more. So she said, everybody line up. I'm going to beat all y'all until somebody tell me who broke my statue. Because somebody, Erica, going to pay for this. Still, didn't nobody say nothing. We were, so we all lined up. And, and, and so she looked at me and pointed and said, I'm going to start with him. Because he the youngest. And he going to break the easiest. So, so, so Otis' aunt pulled up that belt and got ready to swing. And I told you, Otis is my boy. He jumped out of line and said, auntie, I did it. Yeah. And so his aunt went to whooping on Otis. And I sat there and watched. <laughs> I watched Otis take that beating that was meant for me. Yeah, you know where I'm going. Otis endured the pain that I should have got. Otis took the beating. That should have came my way. In other words, Otis took my place. And, and Sister Kit, when the beating was over, I looked at Otis. He looked at me with tears coming down his eyes. I ain't know what to say. He looked back at me, and this is what old Otis said. You owe me. <laughs> That's it, y'all. But a week before Easter Sunday morning, can I tell y'all what the Lord Jesus says? He says, you owe me because I took your place. 
He said, I endured your death. I endured your suffering. And now you owe me. You owe me some praise. You owe me your life. You owe me your thanksgiving. You owe me your glory to God. You owe me your thank you, Jesus. Won't somebody open up your mouth and say, I owe God everything that I have. Because if it had not been for the Lord on my side, if it had not been for Jesus dying for my sins, if it had not been for him going to the cross, there would be no remission of sin. If it had not been for his blood shed, if it had not been for him stretching his arms out, dropping his head down in the locks of his shoulders, if it had not been for him dying on the cross, if it had not been, baby, I'd have been dead, sleeping in my grave, on my way to hell. But because he died, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Tell somebody, I owe God, I owe God. Tell them, I owe God. Hallelujah. Give God a praise. I'm done. I'm done. Hallelujah. But I know I owe him. I owe him. I owe him. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Y'all wait for me to shout, but I ain't hurting my back for none of y'all, but I feel good. Hallelujah. Y'all waiting on me. I'm waiting on y'all. Y'all waiting on me. I'm waiting on y'all. But God has been good whether we shout or not. God has been good because he died. He died. Yes, he died. But the Bible says on three days later, Three days later, three days later, he got up out of the grave with a lot of power. Hallelujah. Tell somebody, I know he lives. Because things I used to do, I don't even want to do them no more. I know he lives. Because places I used to go, I don't even want to go no more. I know we live. So when I used to cuss folk out, God now just allowed me to slap me inside the head. I ain't always the new. I ain't know that I'm still slapping them upside the head. But that's where I'm to be cussing them out, punching them in the face. Tell me, I oh God. Y'all pray for your pastor. I'll keep you the same like y'all one day. But I know he lives. I know he changed my life. I know he turned me around. I know God did it. And it was all because he got up out the grave. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I know that didn't sit well with some of y'all. That your pastor ain't perfect like you. But baby, I serve a perfect God. I serve a perfect Savior. And as long as I keep trying, as long as I keep doing my best, I will be in heaven just like you. How you do? my favorite line tell me where his body lays we can go find Buddha we can go find Muhammad his body's still there you won't find Jesus tell somebody he lives he lives he lives hallelujah yeah, yeah, yeah. the resurrection y'all is the most critical decision you can make. Your faith hangs on in the balance. Your fears hang in the balance. And most importantly, brothers and sisters, 
our forgiveness hangs in the balance. But Jesus says, watch this, if you would just cross that line from unbelief to belief, Jesus said, if you would just confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus died and rose up out the grave. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus, if you just raised him up out of the dead, Jesus said, you'll be saved. He said, you'll be saved. So the challenge, and I'm, I'm finished, the charge to you on this Easter it's real simple are you ready to believe that's your charge just believe Jesus and if you're here today and you've never confessed that belief in the resurrection the, 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 the rising of Jesus out the grave or maybe you've fallen by the wayside and you've turned your back on God or maybe you're just not connected to a church listen I don't want you to just be an Easter season saint. Amen. Don't just, just, just don't be an Easter season. I'm going to come to church during Easter. You know God has much more that he expects from your life. Hallelujah. Other than coming to church one or two weekends out the year. Now don't get me wrong. I'm glad you're here. Don't get me wrong. I want to see your next service. But even more, the Lord wants you to let him in your heart. Amen. Let him in so you can communicate with him every day. Why don't you give your heart to Jesus tonight? Why don't you cross that line of unbelief? And you can sing the old son of Richard sing by Timothy Wright. Yes, I'm a believer. Is it one on tonight? that says Lord I, I give you my life you ain't got to be shamed ain't, ain't nobody in here perfect can't nobody judge nobody no from, from the pool pit back ain't none of us perfect hallelujah and if you tell me you are I'm going to call you a lie to your face because the Bible said we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God amen will there be one on tonight that wants to give their life to Jesus that wants to say, yes, I believe. God, I'm coming to you with my arms outstretched because I know you're, 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 you're ready. His arms are already open waiting for you. Why don't you come on tonight? Will there be one? Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, it's in your son Jesus' name that we come before you right now. Lord, some of us come broken, some of us come bruised, become battered, become scorned, become scarred. But Lord, we're coming. We're coming to the one that can heal us. We're coming to the one that, that can deliver us. We're coming to the one that we believe has all power. Father, you know our needs. You know our desires. Lord, you know our shortcomings. You know where we need help. And Father, we're asking you right now to just help us, Lord. Help us, Jesus. All, all some of us can do right now is just cry out, help. God, we're so deep, we're, we're drowning in this thing that we call life. We keep running the same circle over and over, and nothing's changing. God, we're just hollering out, help. Because, God, we need you. You're the only one that can pull us out of this thing. And, Father, we believe that you can turn it around for our good so that we might be a testimony for somebody else. God, help us to endure it, whether it's sickness, whether it's stress, whether it's anxiety, whatever it is, God. Help us to endure so that we might be a great representation for you. Hallelujah.
Because God, we know if you delivered Job, if you delivered Daniel, if you delivered the three Hebrew boys, if you delivered my neighbor, if you delivered my mama, if you delivered my friends, God, I know you can do it for me. So God, we're going to stand on the healing. Because the word said, by your stripes we're healed. Father, we're going to stand on your guidance. Because we know that if in all our ways, if we acknowledge you, you will direct our path. Hallelujah. We're going to stand on your love. No greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for a friend. We're going to stand on your joy, knowing that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. We're going to stand on your leadership, knowing all we got to do is look to the hills from which cometh our help, knowing all of our help comes from the Lord. Father, we're going to stand on your word tonight. We believe that you can do it, and we know that it shall be done. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, everybody shout amen. Give God a praise in this house. Hallelujah.